Good evening again, and thanks thanks for coming again. We really appreciate everyone who found time on a Monday night to make their way out and uh, and really try and move move this event forward. Well, our first guest was elected to the California State Assembly in 1998. Tony Strickland built a reputation as a conservative leader and as an advocate for lower taxes and smaller government. In 2008, Tony was elected to the State Senate, where he was named uh, the Assistant GOP Leader. A respected conservative leader, Tony helped co-found the Club for Growth in California to support candidates whose top priorities were to ensure that the government limits spending and who support economic policies designed to create jobs. Tony Strickland is proudly pro-life, pro-family, a strong advocate for school choice, charter schools, and protecting our religious rights. Having earned a bachelor's, uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Whittier College, Tony's work was recognized by his alma mater by bestowing him with its Leadership and Service Award. He currently serves as a visiting scholar legislator at USC's Jess Unruh School of Politics, where he teaches and mentors students uh, interested in public life. And will you please help me uh, welcome Tony Strickland. Well, thanks, John. Uh, thank you to the Trinity family for allowing me just to say a few short words. Uh, I'm a candidate for Congress uh, this upcoming election cycle, and if I'm lucky enough to be your next representative in the United States Congress, I will add to those uh, congressmen who have kids in private Christian school, but the difference is I want everybody to have that opportunity, uh, unlike uh, the president and some of the other uh, members who have been talked about. Um, it's a fundamental right uh, to be able to allow parents to choose where they want to send their children to school. No one cares more about that child's future than the parents. And i am uh, always been pushing to do whatever I can to empower parents to have that ability. Um, <clears throat> the school choice movement, uh, we need to keep pounding here in California. We've tried it a few times, but you know we need to keep working towards that goal. Um, me and my wife, Audra, uh, we've been very active in the charter school movement. On top of that, uh, we've helped build charter schools throughout the state of California. And um, you know those numbers that we have here at Trinity, parents around the Santa Cruz Valley should have the opportunity to take those dollars, those hard tax dollars that we tax them, to be able to take those dollars and be able to choose the school of their choice and be able to come to an institution like Trinity to be able, again, looking at the, the, the numbers here at Trinity, I saw the graduating class, um, very impressive, from going to the military academies, to Stanford, to Cal Lutheran, to uh, wonderful schools and institutions. We should never leave a child behind. Uh, we should do whatever we can to allow that child to have that opportunity to be successful moving forward. And so we are very lucky tonight to have a good friend of mine John Fund uh, as the featured speaker. Uh, I've known John Fund a long time. He's been a champion throughout the country on this movement. And uh, I just really appreciate Trinity uh, giving me a, a few short words to talk about uh, uh, my stance. Uh, I'm pro-life, pro-family, pro-school choice. And uh, if you want to know a little bit more about me and my campaign, uh, we'll have information in the back and I can follow up with each and every one of you. But I don't want to take too much time from our featured speaker because our featured speaker has done a remarkable job spreading, um, spreading school choice throughout this country and making sure kids and parents have an opportunity to send their child to a, a quality school quality, and have a quality education like you do here at Trinity. So thanks so much for the time. Um, looking forward to working with each and every one of you. Uh, if I'm lucky enough to be a congressman, I'm looking forward to working with, hand in hand with Trinity on issues that face Trinity uh, and work together to make this an even finer institution than it already is. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate you uh, you coming out tonight. Um, and again, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we're very excited this year to have as our as our featured speaker one of America's foremost journalists and public policy analysts, John Fund. John Fund is national affairs columnist for National Review Magazine and an on-air analyst for uh, the Fox News Channel. He's a notable expert on American politics and the nexus between politics, economics, and legal issues. 
John was born in Tucson, Arizona. He attended California State University, Sacramento, where he studied journalism and economics. He worked as a research analyst for the California legislature in Sacramento uh, before beginning his journalism career as a reporter for the syndicated columnist Roland Evans and, and Robert Novak. John worked for the Wall Street Journal for more than two decades, starting in 1984, and was a member of the journal's editorial board uh, from 1995 to 2001. He's the author of several books, including Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk, Stealing Elections, How Voter Fraud Threatens Our Democracy, and the Dangers of Regulation Through Litigation. Roll Call, the newspaper of Capitol Hill, called him the Tom Paine of the modern congressional reform movement. He has won awards from the Institute of Justice for Justice, the School Choice Alliance, and the Warren Brooks Council for Journalistic Excellence from the American Legisl Legislative Exchange Council. Will you please help me welcome Mr. John Fund. It is obligatory for a speaker to say it's a pleasure for them to be somewhere. Um, in my case, it really is, uh, despite the fact that uh, my luggage didn't quite arrive and complete. <laughs> And I apologize for that. But it is a pleasure to be back in California. Uh, what a blessed surprise. Tony Strickland, who I met when I worked in the legislature, lo, these many years ago. Yes, we are that old, Tony. But, Tony, this country is in such peril. I'm actually going to support you being elected and moving to Washington, D.C., <laughs> because we actually need you. And one of my oldest and dearest friends, Mike Yock, from high school, is here. I haven't seen Mike in an awful long time. So that alone uh, makes this a wonderful event. Um, I'm still a Californian. Um, I know that California has many challenges brought on by its government and its political structure. You know, with California, I've always said, with California's government, I've always said, everyone has a place in life and a purpose in life. In California's case, it's to be a bad example to the rest of the country. <laughs> but seriously, uh, in just talking about education and school choice, I thought I'd take a different approach. Um, you've heard a little bit about how this movement is nationwide. And by the way, I have to say, I've not spent a lot of time at Wally and Liz's school, but I'm already deeply impressed. And I have to say, I read every part of this wonderful magazine, and I hope you actually have plans for franchises, <laughs> because it's needed. Um, there are two jokes that I know about education. Uh, there are not a lot of them, but there are two. Uh, one of them is that um, the story of Billy, who doesn't want to get out of bed and go to school. Doesn't want to get up. Mom, his mom says it's time for school. I don't want to get up. Third try, no answer. Finally, Billy yells downstairs, Give me three good reasons why I should go to school. His mother says, well, it's Monday morning. It's the first day of a new school year, and you're the principal of the school. <laughs> that actually says a lot about the problems in our educational system. Because not only are kids often bored or not fitting in with the schools that they attend, the adults in the system aren't. In fact, Wally mentioned how many parents of public school, how many public school teachers in various school districts, especially urban areas, send their kids to private school. I call them informed consumers. They must know something the rest of us don't, or the rest of us only suspect. And in fact, when George Will, the columnist, interviewed Keith Geiger, the former chair monster of the National Education Association, when he interviewed him on ABC News, he reeled off a lot of the numbers that Wally mentioned. 44% in Philadelphia, public school teachers send their kids to private school. In Milwaukee, it's 41%, et cetera. And at the end of his peration, Keith Geiger, the head of the National Education Association, looked at George Will and said, George, you're completely wrong. It's not 45% nationally send their kids to private school. It's only 40%. That was the defense. And you know, I'm here basically to make a very simple message, which is 
why in the world should you, because obviously we all care naturally most deeply and most clearly for the people who are closest to us, our children, our nieces, our nephews, our relatives, our friends, why should you care that there's a national school choice movement? Why? And the answer really is quite simple. First of all, we have a glaring bit of hypocrisy or double standard in this country, which I think is deeply unfair and is frankly ruining an entire generation in some school districts. Here's the paradox. We believe in choice in everything in American life. Competition is what the essence of our system is, whether it's in baseball or in business. We favor competition. Ever since the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, the government has said its stated intention is to reduce monopoly power, to reduce monopolies. But at the same time, they build up one of the biggest quasi-monopolies ever, the public school monopoly. 90% of kids still go to public school. But you know, there are exceptions to that. And if there's one thing you remember from our discussion tonight, it's this. Choice actually is everywhere in our system still. Let me prove it to you. Let's say you have a youngster under the age of five and you fall below certain income guidelines. There's choice for you. Chris Dodd, Democratic Senator, passed a series of preschool, pre-K vouchers several years ago. These are federally subsidized vouchers for pre-K. There's also Head Start, by the way. Those can be used for any pre-K program, public, private, religious, secular, whatever. We have choice in pre-K. If you fall below certain income levels and you want to exercise that choice. As Wally mentioned, we have choice in universities. Ever since the GI Bill, which laid down the principle that government funding can go to any university for people who have served our country in the military, public, private, religious, secular, we have allowed that kind of choice. So whether it's the GI Bill or whether it's Pell Grants or whether it's federally subsidized student loans since the federal government takeover of student loans, student loans can go anywhere. That's choice if you're over 18. Even K through 12, we have choice. Special needs, a lot of schools can't accommodate special needs children. We often have school districts pay parents so that they can send their kids to specialized schools to take care of learning disabilities or other concerns. In 12 states, the state even has a way of getting rid of disruptive kids who make trouble in class. They go to disciplinary places. In Arizona, they have Atop Academy near Phoenix. So the parents get that disciplinary, you know, non-PC tough love paid for by the taxpayer. There's choice. The difference is it's the principal who decides that the kid gets kicked out and sent to that environment, not the parent. In other words, the people who give the principal the hardest time. So choice is everywhere, except in our educational system for the vast majority of kids, K through 12. And that is no accident. The reason is, if you keep the monopoly, K through 12, the vast number of students are in that cohort, you have the largest number of union members, and the largest amount of dues income, which supports the political power base those union members represent. Now, I'm not trying to be oversimplistic here. There's an awful lot more to this. But I think a reasonable assumption can be made that something changed in our educational system about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy, one of the worst decisions he made, issued an executive order allowing unionization of state and municipal employees. Before then, it was unheard of that a government worker would be a member of a government employee union. Franklin Roosevelt said, it is completely incompatible to have government workers belong to a public employee union because effectively they will, over time, represent both sides of the bargaining table. And that's been the problem. The school board often 
is made up of people who have friends or relatives or neighbors who are in the union. So you don't have a management versus labor adversarial relationship or negotiating position. You have just an open door that you push against. That's how we end up with the school contracts that we end up with. So 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy legalized state municipal unionization of public employees, which back then meant mostly teachers. Now, in real inflation-adjusted dollars, we now spend 10 times more than we did back then. And the results are flat or below what they were 50 years ago. I'm not saying that's the only variable. It's the only thing we look at. But clearly, the injection of public employee unions into the teaching profession to take something which is an honorable goal to impart knowledge and citizenship and character to young people and to make it part of just a governmental bargaining unit, I think we've lost something. We're spending more money and getting less in results. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. You've probably heard in Wisconsin, we had Governor Walker challenge this. And he said, you know, we're going to break this. We're going to have collective bargaining for things that matter, workplace safety, um, living, living conditions, working conditions, all of that. But we're not going to do it over wages and hours and health benefits. That's going to be conducted outside of the union. He basically said to every union member in Wisconsin who was a member of a teacher's union, you can stay in the union or you can elect to take your dues elsewhere. And those dues are significant in Milwaukee. They were $1,000 a year. So a lot of teachers said, well, you know, I don't think this union has been doing much for me. I do know that 215 union officials in the state of Wisconsin have an annual salary greater than that of the governor, so they're living pretty well. And they're not showing up in class. They're all conducting whatever union business is. Maybe I'll get a pay raise. I'm going to get myself a pay raise of 1000 bucks. And sure enough, 63% of public employee union members in Wisconsin are longer part of the union. Last month, the Wisconsin Education Association had to sell their building. The number of million, the number of dollars they invest in political campaigns in Wisconsin is now a shadow of its former self. The union still exists. The union bargains for what the union bargains for that makes sense to the, to the people who still belong to it. But as a political machine, which is what it had become, no, it's been broken. Wisconsin's not the only state. Indiana. Mitch Daniels, the former governor, who, by the way, passed one of the sweeping school choice programs ever seen in this country in 2011. Mitch Daniels, early in his governorship in 2007, declared no state government worker has to belong to a union. You can, but you don't have to. The union cannot reach into your paycheck every week and have an automatic dues deduction, which is how it's normally handled now. We don't allow anyone else to do that to your paycheck. We don't allow the Boy Scouts. We don't allow the Girl Scouts. We don't allow the American Cancer Society. We don't allow the AAA. We don't allow anybody to reach into your paycheck and have a line item that says, we're deducting this from your paycheck automatically. The only private entity in this country that has that privilege are unions. Why should they be the only one to have that privilege? Everyone else has to come to you and say, this is a worthy cause. This is a service you need. Please give us money but not the public employee unions. It's been seven years since Mitch Daniels made that executive order. The percentage of government workers in Indiana who belong to the public employee unions today has dropped to 5%. 5%. It almost makes you ask the question, gee, if so many people didn't think they were getting their money's worth with that dues money, maybe they weren't getting their money's worth. Maybe it was a separate political machine that was operating for the benefit of itself. And that's my point before I get to an interesting anecdote about our history. Look, we all support public education. 
I do. I've never gone to anything but public schools my entire life. But I think we just need to broaden the definition of public education. Instead of public education meaning provided by the government school, public education should mean serves the public. And it can serve the public in many ways. Religious education, classical education, religious classical education, magnet schools, charter schools, traditional schools. If it serves the public, that should be our definition of public education. Now, why is this important for the country as a whole? Benjamin Franklin, when he left the Constitutional Convention, was approached by a little old lady who said, what kind of government are you giving us, Mr. Franklin? And he looked at her and he smiled and he said, a republic, madame, if you can keep it. And that's been the challenge in this country ever since for the last 240 years. We have been bequeathed by our founding fathers, who I believe were divinely inspired, a wonderful system of self-government. And we all, almost always have tried to follow that basic model, but obviously it's broken down in many fundamental respects, including this one. This marks the 25th anniversary of Ronald Reagan's farewell message to the American people as he was retiring from the presidency in January 1989. Now Reagan in his farewell address could have talked about many things. Could have talked about the economy, and he did a little. Could have talked about foreign policy, could have talked about anything. But he chose to focus his remarks on one laser-like message to each and every one of you. We are losing our sense of history. We are not communicating the story of America to our school children, to our children in general. They are losing touch with what it means to be an American, to what American exceptionalism already is. So that we can have a president now who says, of course I believe in American exceptionalism, just like a Greek believes in Greek exceptionalism and a Brit believes in British exceptionalism. No, that's not what was in mind by the Founding Fathers. American exceptionalism is this unique system of self-government, self-restraint, and moral character that we try to imbibe into our people. And we've lost it. Do you think the schools teach civics anymore? Every time I go and listen to another high school class or speak in front of a high school class, I say, wow, I've learned more about things I never thought about but almost nothing about what this country really is all about. Now here at Trinity, I know there's an exception, but I believe there are people who want us to forget the story of America so they can substitute their own story of America. I think some of those people reside and work in the White House right now. So here's the challenge. School choice is the way that we can, without trying to have pitched battles for every school board seat without trying to you know, wrest control of the public schools from people and you know substitute our values for their values to offer choice so that people can have whatever education they think their children and in some cases that their children themselves think they should have that is pluralism that is diversity that is the ultimate tolerance of conflict of differing points of view Everybody can choose. And I'll just leave you with this. Because people often ask me, what got you started on this? What got you interested in school choice? And I'll tell you. You have to go back 30 years to 1984, which was the year George Orwell warned us about was going to be the year of totalitarianism. It turned out it wasn't. It was the year before the Soviet Union started to collapse before we started to win the Cold War. But 30 years ago, I was a very young journalist and I went to Berlin. Uh, I have German relatives and German ancestors. And I went to Berlin on a mission, reporting mission. And remember what it was like back then. You've probably seen pictures. The wall cutting off an entire city. Guard dogs, booby traps, minefields. People killed just simply trying to cross from one border to the next. 
So I went with a friend of mine from the um, German Foreign Office, Foreign Ministry. We went to East Berlin for a day trip. And one of the places I went was the Museum of German History in East Berlin, run by the communists. Learned things there I never learned anywhere else. I didn't learn, didn't know before that that television had been invented by an East German. Didn't know that uh, we were quite as e evil as we communists portrayed us as being. So while we were walking through these grim exhibits of Western perfidy, a little voice spoke up and said, excuse me, sir, do you have the time of day? And we turned around and there was this 13 or 14 year old school child in school uniform with about four or five of her friends lurking behind her and she wanted to know what time of day it was. Well, this was interesting because they had watches on. It was clearly an excuse to try to talk to us. So I asked them, uh, I spoke conversational German, how did you know we were from the West? And they said, oh, it was very simple. We looked at your shoes. They weren't made of plastic. So we knew you were from the West. So we chatted there for a couple of minutes, exchanging pleasantries. Then their teacher, who reminded me of Nurse Ratchet and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, came and she said, it is time for us to leave. So they left. Well, two hours later, by happenstance, we were walking through Centrum Warenhaus, which is the biggest department store in East Berlin, and we bumped into them again. It turned out their teacher, not being particularly um, anxious to squire them around the city, was off on her own shopping trip, so she'd let them loose for the afternoon. So we knew their, they were from a small provincial town in the middle of nowhere. They'd never been to their capital of East Berlin. We actually knew East Berlin very well, so we became their tour guides for East Berlin, their capital. We took them for ice cream. I showed them my passport. They showed us their identity papers. Uh, they told us a little bit about what life was like in a place where if your bicycle lost one of the valves and the tires, you couldn't get it replaced and you ended up not having, to, not having a bicycle. So we had a grand old time and then the end of the day was coming and it was time for us to take the elevated train back to West Berlin. So we started walking to the train station with them. They had never seen the wall at this point. I mean, you could go the whole, we went the whole day and not, didn't see, go close to the border to the wall. And they instinctively knew the wall was coming a couple blocks away around the corner. So they started slowing down. So by the time we literally got to where we could see the wall, we were going at a crawl. And finally, about a block and a half away, they said, you know, they ask questions if you get too close to the wall. We probably should stop here and bid you farewell. And it was a very bittersweet moment for me because my friend and I, we could go anywhere in the world from that point. Even though we were young and not rich, for $500 we could get a flight, take a plane ticket and fly almost anywhere in the world. They couldn't go another 50 yards. They, their world ended where that wall was. So just to make conversation and not to have the moment slip away, I talked to them for a minute and I asked each of them, there were four of them, what did you want to be when you grew up? And one of them said a nurse, and one of them said a teacher, and one of them said a beautician. And the last one, the oldest and wisest one, whose name was Monica, she looked at me, and I'll never forget the expression in her face, very sad, intense eyes. So she said something with great sadness and great conviction at the same time. She looked up at me and she said, it doesn't matter what we become later in life. They will always treat us as children. Always. Wow. I was broken up. We exchanged addresses. We went across the wall. They turned around and went back to look for their teacher and their school bus to go back to their town. And that normally would have been the end of it, but I, we corresponded every once in a while. I'd send her a Christmas postcard or something for the next four years or so, five years. Then 1989 came. And I'm, most of the people here in the room are old enough to remember it. The wall suddenly comes down in a single night. Enormous joy, people streaming across. And I st sat there in my apartment in New York and I wondered if in that mass of people, maybe Monica was there, because she would have been 18 or 19 then. 
And later in the day, the phone rang. And it turns out that Western capitalist companies are very clever. As soon as the wall fell, AT&T and the local version of Deutsche Telekom had immediately had portable phone booths set up near the wall. And they were already trying to hawk their services to these new potential customers. And the come on was, you can make a free call anywhere in the world. Try us out. And by the way, we make house calls. <laughs> so the phone rang, and I picked it up. And on the other end of the line was Monica. And her first words were, John, it is me, Monica. I'm over the wall. Well, I was over the moon for her. So we talked very poignantly. You know, she'd been denied admission to Humboldt University because she was politically incorrect. Uh, she ended up getting readmitted. She eventually became a veterinarian. And I remember how the conversation ended. I, I teased her and I said, remember the conversation on the street corner? And I asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up. Do you still feel that you're never going to be able to grow up? And she said, I think my whole country has graduated from kindergarten to university in one night. So that's a very heartwarming end to the story, but it's not really the end. A few years later, Monica's married. Uh, she's a veterinarian. She's coming to visit the United States. She's coming to California at a time when I will also be there visiting my family. And she has a request. She wants to speak to American high school students. Now, I had some trepidation about that. I go back to my old high school, Bella Vista, where Mike and I went. I go back every five or six years, and I give a talk there. And every five or six years, you know, you just get the sense that, you know, they just not, not as tuned in to the world around them. Tuned into their feelings, tuned into their self-esteem maybe, but not to the world around them or to larger concerns. But I swallow hard and I say, well, I'll take you to an honors class. We had an MGM program, Mentally Gifted Minors program. And so we'll take you to a class there and have you speak. And I sat in on it. And she gave this little talk describing what life had been like under a communist dictatorship. And the kids, most were listening respectfully, but some were, you know, snapping gum and it wasn't a good experience. And at the end, she opened it up for questions. And the first question was from this young lady who said, why in the world would someone build a wall in the middle, down the middle of a city? Why would they do that? They had no conception of what she was talking about. They hadn't learned in class anything, this is high school, about what we spent 40 years fighting and winning a war of four. So afterwards, I felt, as an American, I felt ashamed. So as we were walking out, I tried to explain, you know, this was the wrong class, a, you know, a better class, we can easily find one. And she just held her hand up. She said, John, please, I understand all of what you have said, but I've now figured out what part of your problem is. And I braced myself and I said, uh-oh, what is it? And she said, no matter what they end up doing, this place, waved her hand, is going to let them continue to think like children. Let them to continue to think like children. And I said to myself, we say we want to create self-sufficient, reasoning, people of good character, adults. That's what we say we want to do. I think there are people running our current educational system in large part who I think directly or indirectly want to infantilize a lot of the people that they have charge over so that they don't think for themselves. Perhaps they become dependent on others. Perhaps they become dependent such that they have to support certain political parties or political philosophies to feel secure in life rather than to provide for their own security as much as is possible, assuming they're of good health and mind. That's our challenge. I'm not saying Everything that's taught in the schools is bad. I'm not saying the schools aren't producing wonderful kids. I've met many of them. But I see a trend. 
And the trend harkens back to what Ronald Reagan warned us about. We're losing our sense of history. Clearly, there is a conscious effort to deprive our children today of their history. Clearly, there's a conscious effort not to let them know why we're exceptionally American and different from everyone else, with a country founded on ideas and principles and freedoms and not on blood or geography. The way to march us back to teaching those principles is through school choice. Not everyone will partake of it. Not everyone will want it. But frankly, it is a crime not to allow people the opportunity, regardless of income, to have a chance to give their children the kind of education many of us got and many of us still aspire that future generations will have. Thank you very much. I think a better way to phrase the question would be, if I could wish for some public policy um, that would happen overnight, what would it be? I would say, I think it would be trying to instill, you know, they're, they're bad entitlements and they're good entitlements. Bad entitlements are you expect someone to support you even when you don't need support. And the money goes to everyone regardless of income. That's the bad entitlement. Or regardless of background, that's the bad entitlement. A good entitlement is knowing what your freedoms are, knowing what your space is, knowing what your rights as an American citizen are. If I could convey anything to the American people, it is this. So many of you have been gulled or seduced or, or th thought to believe that Social Security is something you paid for, when in reality, you know, you're going to get far more in benefits than you ever paid in, but the return on your investment is actually far smaller than it would be in anything else you did, and you were a savings passbook. So many of us have this sense of entitlement that we paid for our Social Security or we paid for our Medicare, when actually we really haven't that much. But here's the entitlement I wish that we did instill in people. If you pay taxes, you own a house, you pay taxes, you buy things in the store, that, collect, that creates money that goes into the educational pool, the, the fund for the community. The first call on that money should be by your child. It should be strapped on your child like a backpack and it should be portable, and you can take it anywhere. It should be your money dedicated to an educational purpose. Yes, we take it from you, but for a purpose. And you, we trust you to make the decision on how you spend it. Rather than we all put it in a pool and there's no accountability, and unless you get to elect a majority of the school board, you don't have any say. And even then, you probably don't have any say because the union contract will probably override that. If there's one thing I could do, it is the money you pay, which is thousands of dollars for education, even though you're putting it into a common pool for the benefit of all of us that we have an educated citizenry, it's still your money. And we should think of it as that. Well, it depends if you want to think locally or globally. If you want to think locally, probably the best thing you can do is talk to Tony Strickland about how you can help the charter schools survive this legislature. Because now the liberals have a super majority in the legislature, they're going to put real pressure on the charter schools. If you want to think globally, there are various school choice organizations, and if you see me after the talk, I can direct you to some of them or I can take your card. And even though their work may primarily not be in the state of California, this is a national movement. This requires national support because we're all Americans and we're all the victims of the kind of degradation our educational system is seeing right now. And by the way, there's one quote, and I wanted to go back to this, which actually I saw reprinted here in this wonderful Trinity magazine. If you don't think that the people who, st remember, when America was founded, we didn't have a public school monopoly. We had schools, but we didn't have a public school monopoly. 
That came in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. The founder of the public school monopoly was a guy named Horace Mann. And he wanted a government school system because he saw it as a way to mold society, particularly children, to fit their ideology of social improvement. John Dewey was his disciple. Now this is a quote, and I've actually checked this out. This is an accurate quote. Listen to the tourist man explaining why we needed a government public school monopoly. Quote, you can't make socialists out of individualists. Children who know how to think for themselves spoil the harmony of the collective society which is coming, where everyone is interdependent. I guess he thought it took a village to create the collective society that he wanted. Is there any clear explanation of what the people who founded this government public school monopoly wanted? I'm not accusing the people who currently run it of wanting that, but boy, talk about a terrible antecedent and inspiration. For one thing, it's hopeless. They probably think, you know, it's, it's like talking about you know, going to Mars tomorrow. It's just not going to happen, so why do you bother? And in California, there's some plausibility to that. I mean, school choice has been uh, under siege in California, the few places it's been tried. By the way, the first experiment in school choice was actually in California. It was in the Alum Rock School District in a program pioneered by Milton Friedman in 1971. Um, I think one of the finest school choice programs in California is actually based out of Silicon Valley. It's all of the computers that allow people to find stuff on them by themselves. It's the Khan Academy. You know, have you ever seen those wonderful videos, the Khan Academy videos? They're all produced for a pittance, a few dollars, and I've seen them at work. They're not, they're not a panacea, but they're wonderful vehicles for school choice. The homeschooling movement is a great vehicle for school choice, too. The reason is we have brainwashed people to think if you're against government schools, you're against education. And if there's one other message I think we need to convey to people, it's if a pu public education is what serves the public. If a school isn't working, it isn't serving the public. If a school is working, it doesn't matter what kind of school it is. It can be government, public, private, religious, secular, whatever, as long as it serves the public. Bad schools, no, no matter who runs them. Good schools, yes, no matter who runs them. That's about the simplest distillation I can make. And believe me, if they disagree with that premise, probably best to keep on moving down that supermarket aisle because <laughs> you're not going to get very far with them. <laughs>